You got it. in the office this afternoon. So. Okay. okay, let's call this uh, workshop, special workshop meeting of the Jacksonville City Council in order. And we have an agenda, copy the a proposed agenda for tonight, and at this time I would uh, entertain a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Not all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. First item tonight we have on the agenda is uh, the personnel policies and procedures, and I'll turn it over to you now, Dr. Woodruff, to open this up. Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, some of the important things that you accomplish for the citizens are ordinances and services. One of the hidden things that you accomplish is to set the policies and the procedures relative to the way that we operate the city from a personnel standpoint. Over the last year, your city attorney, John Carter, and your chief human resources uh, person, uh, Kimberly Lindsay, have been working to update our policies. John and Kimberly are going to provide you a presentation on why these need to be updated. Each of you has received both electronically and then in paper form the documents. Normally, we do not go through them uh, page by page. We would, of course, for this evening, uh, welcome any input and direction, and we certainly can go through them page by page. This is not a document that has to be adopted by a set date. Our goal, though, is that sometime within the next two or three workshops to finish the review, and hopefully in March, or possibly even earlier if you're ready, to take the necessary legislative actions or council approval actions to formally amend your current policies and procedures and to place these in place of those that you'll be amending. Uh, Kimberly has a PowerPoint. You each also received last night a, what I'll call an errata sheet, not an errata sheet, rather a cheat sheet, that helps you see which policies you're dealing with. Last evening, I had the opportunity to do a little 
uh, tallying, there are actually 52 policies that are in your proposed personnel policy manual. 34 of those have no changes to them at all. And they're reflected in the document basically as black and white. They are just, you know, policies that are there. They exist today. We're not recommending any changes. There are eight brand new policies. Those are primarily policies that are required because federal law has changed or because your legal team has determined that it's appropriate to have a policy on a specific issue. And then there are about 10 policies that exist pretty much but have some wording changes or maybe words or paragraphs are being moved from a former policy to a new policy. So I don't want you to look at this document and think, wow, that's a completely new thing. The vast majority of this is not. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly and to John and ask them to proceed. At any time that you have a question, please feel free to ask it, Mayor. I got a question uh, up front here. Um, just, just to clear up my curiosity, where does it become a responsibility of the council for these types of policies here? I mean, aren't these administrative in nature? No, sir. Uh, remember, and again, this will be part of Kimberly's presentation. But back in 2007, and I believe you were here, <coughs> Mayor Robin Davis worked with me at that time, and. That we called it uh, a resolution that council actually uh, passed, but there's certain things that are required by federal and state law that council adopt. The policies are those things. You must adopt those, and then according to your ordinance, which I'm getting into Kimberly stuff here now that's in the presentation. But the council, when you took everything and went from uh, code to policy, took a, your whole chapter 18 out of the ordinance, except for the one about department heads living in the city of Jacksonville and the 14-day rule that has been utilized as far as changing some of the uh, procedures that it, it says in there also that the procedures that need to come before council have to do with hiring firing and compensation and so by that ordinance the policies and those procedures which you have here in your the four procedures in front of you tonight uh, are required by either ordinance or by federal or state law that the council act on them there's a bunch of other procedures that the manager will be acting on, and part of pushing the actual adoption out into the first meeting of March is to give the manager and the department heads an opportunity to review some of those procedures. Right, that's what I wanted to be clear on, is what was within our... Yes, sir. Uh, We're only bringing what is by ordinance or... And I think the presentation will probably clear that up for you. Um, I want to thank you for having me this evening. I appreciate the opportunity, the opportunity to present to you the project or the results of it. Um, although this project was actually initiated in 2007, um, I, I'm excited to say that the partnership between uh, the city attorney, the human resources team, and really the leadership team of the city who has also reviewed these, um, we are complete. So um, what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of background. In 2007, the decision was made, as uh, Mr. Carter just said, to move the policy language from what was code to administrative policy. There were several issues that existed that needed to be addressed. One was that our administrative um, policies included procedure language, not policy language, but procedure language, needed to be moved out to the how to, the procedure piece. We also had practices and language that were actually in conflict with policies and in conflict with procedures. And simply put, we just didn't have some policies or procedures we needed. So what did we do? Well, we actually conducted a comprehensive review. We've, uh, this actually started the minute I walked in here. It was one of those um, projects that were a priority for the human resources team. So we did a comprehensive review of all the materials. We looked at the current ad administrative policies and procedures manual. We looked at the human resources procedure manual. Looked at the employee handbook. We also researched policies and procedures from other North Carolina cities and counties. And we also looked at um, the North Carolina League of Municipalities because we wanted to look for some best practices, particularly around those policies or procedures that we were missing. So what were the results? Well, we've completed the Human Resource Policy Manual, and that's the black binder, the ring, black ring in front of you. And we've also completed the Procedure Manual. Now, what you have in front of you is only four of the procedures. So what we're asking t 
today is to do a review process. And I, I need you to understand, too, that this has been a comprehensive review. This wasn't just something Human Resources put together. Um, Dr. Woodruff, Mr. Massey, City Attorney John Carter, and the Human Resources staff as a whole have reviewed these in detail um, and made changes over a, about a year's time. Then we went to the leadership team, and the leadership team reviewed them as well. Now we're here with the City Council, and we're asking you to take a look at them. So our next steps. As John Carter said, the ordinance requires that the City Council review and adopt all policies. That is the black ring binder. Also that the Council must review and adopt any procedures, just those procedures that affect the hiring, the firing, or the compensation of employees. And we believe, after review, that we have four categories, um, four procedures that fall into that category. They are absence from work, employee benefits, employee discipline action, and then pay plan. I think that kind of answers that question that you had, Mayor Phillips. So we have a timeline. And the timeline is starting right now, tonight. Um, we're presenting this to you, and I know you had gotten this in advance, but I do realize, too, it's a lot to take in. So what we wanted to do is present to you um, both documents, the full policy binder, and then the four procedures. We'd ask that there be a review period um, but up until March 3rd. And at that point, during that period, I would hope that you would call me directly or John Carter We've worked on this project together and can either or both of us answer any questions that you have about any of the uh, policies or any of the four procedures. And then March 4th, our hope is that we'd be able to adopt the policies in whole and then the four procedures that um, affect the hiring, firing, and the um, compensation of all employees. And then if adopted, March 5th, they would go in conjunction with all the other procedures. So to your point, Mayor Phillips, there are a lot of administrative procedures you're not looking at tonight. Those are being reviewed actually right now by the leadership team. And then hopefully we'll have those complete at the same time that we can get these four and the policies adopted so that March 5th, <coughs> Dr. Woodruff would sign off on all new policies and procedures and we could communicate it as a comprehensive package. That's our hope. Any questions before I move to our cheat sheet? Let me make one comment. On the procedures that you will not be seeing tonight, uh, you're certainly welcome to come and see them and review them. Sure. But they, those are procedures that technically you should not ever be asked to adopt because there's a very different, if I may use the term, a legal standing between certain procedures that you bless and administrative procedures. And those divisions have been established through the legal process, in many cases, court cases. So we're not saying to you that we are going to keep away from you those other 70 procedures. You want to come and look at them, we'll be very happy to show you them to you. Give me an example of one of those. Well, I'll give you an example, travel. Recently, we looked at the travel policy, and as you know, we have a per diem. And the per diem said that if you leave, you can get breakfast at so many dollars, lunch at so many dollars, and dinner at so many dollars. And I looked at that and I said, you know, personally, I just disagree with that. If you're going to be leaving your house at 5 o'clock in the morning to go to Raleigh for an 8 o'clock meeting, the city should not, have, should, should not pay you your breakfast. You should eat Cheerios at home. So we changed the policy. I also looked and it said, this is how much money you'll get for lunch. And I put it in my own perspective and I said, last time I ate at Chick-fil-A, it didn't cost $40 for lunch. So I changed that. Those are the type of things that, that are in those procedures that you're welcome to look at. I would strongly encourage you never get involved in those type things. Now, John, can you give another example? Well, I, I want to make a comment first. I want to go back to 2007 because that was an important time for the city of Jacksonville. At that time, we made you aware uh, that there were federal case laws that said if you had your personnel rules and regulations in ordinance form, that your employees were vested with property rights and due process rights. And the presumption was always that we're always employees at will, if you will. So therefore, to take away that due process, it was encouraged that we move those out of the ordinance into the policy. 
and they were done in 2007 with one, one swoop by the council that night. A couple of things have happened since then. One is that they needed to be looked at on a periodic basis to be updated to make sure they're in compliance with laws, federal laws, state laws as they change. But also we need to, we needed to make them, and we are working toward that, where there are more, uh, where you can find them easily. And we're working with IT and we're going to have it so that if you wanted discipline, for example, you can go in and put the search box discipline and it'll pull up all the policies and procedures that deal with discipline. That's my goal so that, again, it'll be more accessible to the employees. And that's why I raised that original question and I asked somebody, is at what point do we go from an at will yes, employment to actually a contract, sort of, sort of speak, not, well, not necessarily a contract, but but gave them due process rights given, by being given those rights in the code of the process. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, with that, if you're ready, we'll start looking at your uh, cheat sheet, as you call it. Well, Please. and I'm looking at this one, which is lengthwise. And the and the reason I um, recreated in human resources these cheat sheets is because I'd really just like to take a couple minutes and just walk you through this. Um, so, for example. And let me read this to you. So the first policy, and I'm in the black notebook, the first policy is organization of the personnel system, page three and four. Okay, there's no change. That came from the resolution. I don't think we probably need to spend much time on that, but this is for you to take home, and if you want to read that and digest it, you're welcome to. Or if you have questions as we go through. And the, revolu the resolution referred to is the 2007 resolution that was passed at the November council meeting that night by council. So then the second is absences from work, and that is on page five. Now we're in the policies, which are the overarching statements, policy statements. How you administer that policies is the procedures. We're not there. We're in the policies. So absence from work, which is on page five, okay, this is a new policy statement. But the procedures are consolidated, and they're in a different text. So where you see it is yellow, meaning that's a new policy statement. I'm going to continue if I may. Mm -hmm. So civil leave is six, no change. That came from the resolution. Now, if you go to the next page, which is seven, that's diversity and inclusion. We did not have a policy around diversity and inclusion, so we created one. So that is new text. Also dress code, that is new text. And Mayor Phillips, you asked earlier about, you know, which procedures could we give you an example. Just as an FYI, all of these policies have a procedure you're not seeing those procedures, you're welcome to. I'd be happy to put a binder together for you. Only the ones that affect the firing, hiring, and compensation are the ones you'll be reviewing. Okay, so that's um, dress code is eight, and as you can see, we put it in yellow because that is new. Drug-free workplace, nine, page nine, no changes. Education training reimbursement, 10. Now, this is new policy, it's a new policy statement, but we pulled it out of procedures. Remember we said earlier there was some procedure language that was in policy? We had to go back and pull some language into policy and create a policy for a procedure that existed, and then we did that here. And one of the reasons why this was pulled over to you is because it has financial implications. Well, this is policy. Okay, so page 11, this is the educational leave with pay, and the only um, text that is new is yellow. Are you comfortable with me walking through each page? Should I continue to do that? I'm fine. Kind of tedious, I think. <laughs> well, I think you can. I think you can see from uh, the examples that Ms. Lindsay has given you how the document is actually prepared. Now, what you will notice. As we said earlier, out of the 52 policies, 34 of them just are no changes at all. What we might do is encourage you over the next several weeks to go through every one of these, whether they're black and white, which means no change, or whether they're yellow, which means that they are changes, and determine whether you need additional clarification. This evening, if there are policies, because I know you've had this for several uh, days to look at, but if there are any that you want to discuss specifically tonight, we can also do that. Give me an example of a policy hiring and firing. You've got that classified as a policy? Well, actually, that's going to come under procedures in just a minute. 
so the procedure on how to hire. Okay. Okay, so the, I just want to be clear. The, the policies. So why are we involved in that in procedures, hiring and firing, when that's a, I thought that's a basic tenet of the council manager, formal government. Manager has the right to hire and fire. In accordance with the procedures that are adopted by council, because your ordinance says you want to have a hand in hiring, firing, and compensation. And there's only four that fit into that category, and they're in the blue binder. Well, I don't, I don't want to be argumentative, but the ordinance says that. That's, in, that's something council has passed. Is that's that correct. In, is that in compliance with the council manager plan of North Carolina? Yes, because you're not telling the manager who to hire and fire. You're just setting up a framework yeah. so that you know that he, every one of us is being, or not, a, but all employees are being treated the, the same way. I mean, you, you set up a procedure. But again, it's not totally up to the manager to hire okay. and fire. Okay, all right. That, I that's it. All right. Okay, I'll ask a question about one uh, that I would I, I put a note down here for clarification. It was on the education and training reimbursement. What page are we on? Uh, so there would be a policy. Uh, there was, there is, I'm sorry, sorry, page 10. There's a procedure to go along with this. Yes. yes that's think correct. It would outline exactly what qualifies for reimbursement. Yes. What you how have much? to do, how you have yes. to submit your reimbursement. Step by step. Mm -hmm. And a form. For an application to be reimbursed, yes. Okay, but it says May. Uh, now, on the May, uh, may be paid or, or reimbursed. So I guess that you have specific Indeed. instructions to employees as to what you know. Yes. But the way that the policy is written with the word May, it means that you are authorizing us to pay it. Okay. We, as the management, will then set forth the procedures. So, for example, if we put in there for education that you must make a B or better in order to be paid, you've authorized us to do that. If we said, well, as, as if you went to Clemson and even got a D, we'll pay it, you know, <laughs> we could do that. I'm not so sure we would use that, you know, but the point being, this is an authorization policy. The procedure which the city staff will follow says specifically what type of education. But let me give you an example. If you're a mechanic and you're going for certifications, the city will pay for those. If you're a mechanic and what you want is dog obedience training, we're not going to pay for that. Or if you want to become a nurse while you're a mechanic, we're not going to pay for that. There has to be a relationship between the course you're taking and the job that you are currently doing, not a job you may want to do, but a job you're currently doing with the city. So the procedure part will lay out what qualifies in the way of education, what kind of institutions have to be there. Uh, likewise, you know, for example, there are many institutions that uh, are not actually accredited. We're not going to pay for some of those, depending if, if it's a certification Match class, for example. University. Pardon me? Matchbook University. Or yes, University. something like that. So, so the whole that's qualification in that statement there is the May. It correct. gives you the... Okay. Yes. But, yes. but council also has the authority to not approve in the budget the funds correct. to reimburse. And so if that's I could, another control that council has. And if I could just give you an example, um, if you look at page five, which is absences from work, okay which is new policy language and you can see that's an overarching statement about absences from work now i'm going to ask you for a minute and i hope this doesn't confuse things this page is exactly the same one we're going through but for the procedures okay this is the long page do you see i mean the portrait no landscape <laughs> page whichever <laughs> if you'll notice the procedure for absence from work do you see that on the left Look how many sections are in it. So the overarching policy on absence from work covers, as you can see, many things. And if you'll turn to your to your thinner document that's in the blue binder, mm -hmm. you'll actually see the procedure that implements this policy. And you'll notice that while the policy is a paragraph, the procedure is, what, 14 pages or something like that. So to your question, Mayor Phillips, there are detailed procedures for, for policies, if necessary, so that the employees know exactly how to, uh, because it really is a how to. Now, I'd be happy to pick up where we left off on the policies and go through those if you'd like. 
can you can you just explain the three day absence rule that you have? So if someone is sick for more than three days, they fall into a medical, a family medical leave, or a different. If someone is out for more than three days, we ask for a doctor's note to validate that they're they were sick and are healthy to come back. They don't fall under FMLA at that okay. point. We also, when you look at the procedures, if a person has a pattern of filing for illness, every Monday they're out, then we can start requiring them to show a doctor's statement as to why you're out. You know, if the reason why you're out is you had a rough weekend and you're just taking sick leave to recover, then we're going to start disallowing that use. If on the other hand, uh, for whatever reason, you really do have the flu once a week, and it happens on Mondays, then we want you to document it. And I think we left off at education on 10. In which document? I'm in the policies, which is black, the black binder. But I would ask the question, uh, you know, Mr. Bittner said uh, that it was tedious going through that. Uh, what I would suggest is this. Uh, rather than go through it page by page, if you have specific questions from your former review, we can discuss those tonight. On the other hand, you now see how it is organized, and we can put this on the workshop for two weeks away for, for more specific discussion. But you give us the guidance. We can review and then comment uh, at that time. Okay. I'm okay with that. Fine with me. I just have a question. Please. When we were getting the, the legal position on how involved counselors should get in policy, there was mentioning of at will employment versus due process. Um, understanding that this is an at will state, that doesn't mean that municipalities and governments have to avoid due process for employees or adopting regulations that promote due process. I think maybe at some point it would be healthy to have the discussion about what it is we're trying to avoid in terms of responsibility for due process because I think due process is a good thing and I think that when you have regulations that promote that it encourages morale within the employees that you have and it helps with recruiting quality employees so I don't want to be uh, perceived as this um, engaging in this dichotomy where you have at will versus due process I think that um, we have a policy in here against cronyism um, nepotism nepotism, nepotism. Um, I would assume that if somebody got disciplined uh, or didn't get a job because of uh, nepotism or that there would be due process that would be allowed to that employee. So at some point, I, we need clarification on what we mean when we say, um, if we say, you know, we don't want to give due process. Well, uh, first of all, I don't think, okay, John. Do pro There's a, a, a blog by the School of Government that I will send out to council. But it begins with the concept that we are all employees at will in the government arena. But then it says, let me tell you about the exceptions. Well, if you're female or if you're uh, of different races, et cetera. And I believe time they go down the exceptions, there's 25 or 30. <laughs> so due process is alive and well and being protected. And it's just really an eye opener because well, when it's you, built into our policies, is it? Yes, right? but mean, I will, I'll, I'll get that out to council. I think that would give you a, a comfort of level that uh, clearly your employees are protected through federal and state laws that uh, recognize all of these different uh, folks. You can't supersede even them. age. Yeah. Well, uh, even 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 class. even in our own policy, we have avenues for appeals. We oh have yes, sir. All the way through the manager, and then of course we yeah, can and be. Those are due process avenues, right? Yep. Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but again. The one thing I would assure you, we nothing in this document is intended to uh, trample upon a person's due process rights. 
we also need to understand that not everything in here a person has the right to question. I mean, I'll go back to the example I gave regarding meals. You know, if, if Ed Richards, who's sitting over there, very good city employee, doesn't like the new policy, I hate to say it, tough. It's, that's the policy. He doesn't have the right to appeal that he should get $10 for breakfast when I say he should get nothing for breakfast. That's not due process. The due process are the, what I'll call the more important things. They are the things about how you are to be treated as an employee, how your grievances are to be heard, how your promotion is to be handled, how your competition for other jobs is to be fair and, and stable. Those are the type of things that Mr. Willingham is talking and about. And every management decision shouldn't be up for a debate. That's, that's what correct. you're saying, and that's true. I mean, we wouldn't be able to get anything done if we went by that policy. But I think he raises a very good point. John, you're going to provide some guidance. <laughs> and I want to assure you, though, uh, you will find that the new policies, I'm sorry, the new procedures go a long way to clarify how those due processes are laid out. So. And just, just for clarification, as far as I understand it, in an at-will state, you hire and fire at will. You make employment decisions at will. Federal law supersedes that with Title VII and employment discrimination. So you could make a decision for any reason except that you can't discriminate for race, sex, national origin, et cetera. That's federal law. Anything you build within those parameters is a governmental decision that we come up with and have to be comfortable with. Correct. And that's why in the thinner document, one with the blue binder, you will find very detailed discussions about the hiring, the firing, and the compensation. It's actually a well done document. I thought it was. Thank you. It was a lot of work by a lot of people. A lot of work. Yeah. If nothing else, I think what it did, honestly, it needed to be redone just to make sure that it was uh, much more comprehensive and help the employees with more direction, specific direction. So I'm glad we got it done. One thing I would also mention, uh, Mary Donalds, who's with us tonight, uh, had a large hand in this with the HR department, so I'd certainly like to recognize her. We would encourage you then over the next two weeks, we'll put this, uh, to read this and, and get with John or Kimberly or any of the management, we'll put this back on for specific discussion two weeks away. Is that acceptable? Yes. The second item on the workshop this evening is a transportation update. Uh, Anthony Prince will be joining us. Anthony. You each have documents uh, at your table. Uh, Mr. Bloomingham, did you get a set of these? Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Mayor, if it's acceptable, I'll turn it over to Anthony. Anthony, please. Thank you, Dr. Woodger. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. It's always it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Uh, what I would like to do is start the transportation update with a brief overview of some changes to uh, state uh, law as well as NCDOT policy regarding the transportation prioritization and funding process. And hopefully that review will provide some context that will lead us into a discussion on transportation needs uh, the document that, that you have at your seat there. Um, giving some background on what that actually is, uh, what it contains, and, and why we developed that. And then, of course, what the expectation is once we get to the end of this prioritization process. Some of this will be new information, and some of it will be a review from the, the last budget workshop. But as you well know, we are under a new state transportation appropriation model. It's known as the Strategic Transportation Investment Program, or STI for short. And essentially what this does, it creates the overarching policy that takes federal and state transportation revenues and appropriates them to the different DOT programs, whether it's uh, new road construction, or whether it's maintenance, bridge replacement, all of those programs that DOT has, that policy um, appropriates the funding, at least at a general level. 
Underneath that, the DOT has new prioritization processes. And for the discussion tonight, we'll focus on uh, prioritization 3.0, or what is known as P3.0 uh, for short, that looks at the capital investment side of things. Okay, so with this procedure, DOT takes that general funding appropriation and uses a prioritization model to determine how they're going to distribute funding to the individual projects. And uh, it's, it's a very complicated model. Our TAC members know it far too well, but uh, we'll just stick to the generality of it for the discussion tonight. The project list that was distributed is just one component of this P3.0 process, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail on another slide here. I believe you saw this slide, or at least one very similar to it, at the last workshop. And what it shows is just a graphic representation of what the new STI model is. Um, it breaks funding for capital investment down into three components. And as you can see there on the screen, it's a hierarchical structure. Excuse me, hierarchical structure, if I said that correctly. Um, at the top there, we have an appropriation for statewide investment, where eligible projects are going to be on things like interstate highways or a class one railroad, and uh, really improvement projects to the largest state airports that are out there. The next step down is the regional level, where improvements will be to things like NC and US routes, uh, regional airports like OAJ. Um, and then the lowest level, or the most localized level, is division, where improvements to our local roadways, our bicycle and pedestrian network, public transit, and the like will be funded. Um, the 10-year revenue projections for each one of those funds is shown on the screen. I would love to tell you that that's an annual revenue projection, but it surely isn't. Uh, needless to say, the state as well as the federal um, highway trust fund are, are not looking too good these days, mainly because fuel consumption is down. But that is a conservative estimate that, that's a 10-year outlook. With this system, there is a concept called cascading, at least that's how it's referred to, um, where statewide projects are, uh, are able to trickle down to other funding pots based upon need. So for instance, you have an interstate project in that statewide category, okay? And maybe you don't have enough money in that category to pay for the entire project, or it just doesn't compete well with its peers, uh, it would then cascade down into the regional level for, uh, for consideration, prioritization. And if it doesn't pan out there, it could then trickle down to the division level as well. So that's a good and a bad thing, of course. Uh, the good part about it is, is that more than likely statewide projects are going to be funded, okay? The bad part about that is the potential for displacing regional and division level projects. And once we get to the project list, uh, you'll note that by far, a majority of our projects are in that regional and division level. Let me give you an example of one that might cascade down. You know that being a military community, one of our goals is to improve rail transportation to the ports. This is not in this, in this program, I'll give you an example. That may start off as a statewide funding project but it doesn't compete well because they say, well, that's really primarily from Fayetteville and Jacksonville to Wilmington and to Moorhead City. So it gets bumped down to the regional level. At the regional level, it may get even bumped down further. So, you know, the, the point being, uh, things that from one perspective may be state, this cascade can move them well down the funding. And I think the most important thing is when you look at a state as large as North Carolina, and you realize there's only $1.5 billion a year to do everything we need for this level of transportation, you can see that the cascading is going to happen. And the group that's going to wind up being the last to be funded are going to be the division, the local. And that's why Mr. Massey mentioned to you during the 
workshop on uh, in uh, January the 21st about why you may want to consider establishing a local match, local City of Jacksonville funds, because that's going to help you compete. Now, with that, Anthony. Yes, sir, and uh, that's a very good point to make. And and another extremely real example for the state is I-85. Um, every single enhancement project for that facility is within the statewide level, and they're all very expensive. We're talking billions of dollars worth of improvements over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, so those projects, particularly in those areas, uh, will begin to suck up the regional and division level funds because there's just not enough money, but it's a critical need because it's a vital piece of infrastructure. Um, that example doesn't apply very well to Jacksonville because we're in a different division, but we are in the same region. So it will pull up some of those regional dollars from, from our area. Prioritization 3.0, as I mentioned before, this is the DOT's process of appropriating those funds for capital investment to individual projects. Uh, and we've been working on P3.0 for the better part of a year now, but publicly uh, we rolled out the process in October of 13. We had an open call for projects, and uh, truthfully we got some, some good insight. There were a lot of valid projects and concerns that people had, uh, but we also got some pretty entertaining feedback as well. Uh, taking that all into account, uh, we developed a draft project list that was, a, that was reviewed and approved by the TAC last month. And what that does is it creates the baseline inventory of all the transportation needs for our region. And that's what we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes. With that inventory, what we'll do next is move into the prioritization process. Knowing that there aren't adequate funds to fulfill all of these needs, we need to prioritize uh, the needs for our area so that hopefully we can provide that, DO, uh, that feedback to DOT and get a handful or however many compete well within the prioritization process uh, funded for construction within the next uh, five to 10 years. Uh, with that prioritization process, we will solicit public comment again, develop a draft prioritization list, and at that time, we'll proactively seek feedback from the City Council as well as from the County Commission on those priorities. Uh, the intent is to have that feedback by midsummer of 2014 so the TAC can then finalize the prioritization list and, and send that along to DOT. All of this work uh, culminates in the adoption of a state transportation improvement program. Now that's the actual document that programs every single fund, uh, federal and state, to individual improvement projects uh, throughout the state. Any questions on the process before we move into the prioritization list itself. Anthony, one thing you may want to mention, being that this is the first time under this new regulation, we really don't know what that cascading effect is going to be and how these statewide projects are going to score and shift down into the regional and then potentially some of the regional to the division level. And so until we go through a full year's worth of process, we're really not going to know what the impacts are going to be at our level. And uh, because of that, and we've known that all along, you know, we work very hard to try to get as much local input in our prioritization uh, uh, voice as we possibly could. And we right. did the best we could. It's, the outcome wasn't exactly like we wanted, but I think it was better than what was initially proposed. So uh, it's going to be a, a process. And I think that uh, we're going to see at the end of this process that we're going to have some challenges. Uh, yes, sir. And that's an excellent point. And one thing I should point out here is that at the statewide level, unfortunately, we have no local voice on those priorities. Uh, that's 100% data driven by the DOT prioritization model. However, at the regional level, we pick up about 30%. Okay. 
but at the division level we pick up about 50 percent and uh, both of those percentages are split between feedback from the MPOs and RPOs as well as the the local division NCDOT division engineer and as Anthony mentioned you could have two projects eat up 80 percent of the money up at the statewide level you look at 85 and you look at 95 and the problems with those two roads they could potentially depending on how the priority pro uh, prioritization yes, process goes they could eat up the bulk of the money at that level you're exactly right sir and when i mentioned 85 before i, I did mention 95 so that was a bit of a slip there but that that is a, a huge need and unfortunately there's just not enough money to go around at this point and what is the uh term or the time i'm sorry go to the next one Mm -hmm. That last thing, yes, sir. the state transportation improvement program, mm -hmm. that, how often is this going to be established? Is that going to be a well, it varies. Program? Pardon me? I'm sorry, sir. It, it, it varies. Oh. Usually it's a two-year update cycle. Okay. Uh, we started the process in, in 2012 to update from what we did in 2011, but because of the new legislation, we actually delayed an update of the TIP to, to 2015. It's, it's, five, it's a five-year program. Yes. The, and every two years, you, you update. So that in theory, you bring two more years in, mm -hmm. you know, because you've, you executed the first two years, right. you're bringing two more in. But for those projects to be able to go forward, they have to score and have funding. Yeah, that's right. Mayor Pro Tem Lazar was just mentioning about the governor's 25-year initiative on that 25-year plan. Is change. that going to change? That, that's got the potential to change all that too, right? I think there's a lot of conversation out there right right now that could actually change this for the next go-round. We're pretty much set in stone for this process, but in the future, I do expect some changes. And uh, with P3.0, that is the third version of this, tri this prioritization process. And every time we've done it, there, there have been changes, uh, mostly improvements, though. Yeah, and how, uh, how the scores are assigned to each project. Right. I mean, the, the reason we're having this discussion right now is because we've got this list of projects that we're submitting for scoring. And then you know when 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 we get the score results back then we'll see how well they compete and talk about which ones are most important because as anthony mentioned the projects at the regional level and the division level part of the their ranking is determined by their spot 3.0 score and the other part of it is determined by the value the points that are assigned Locally. locally and by the division engineer and That's another right. very important point that we've heard over and over again that local match mm -hmm. will greatly increase the scoring of any project so for yes, example sir. if we have a project that we really want to get done but we know it's not going to score very high we can do a local match and that would bump it up Yes, sir. Sort of what you were talking about earlier. That's not been done before. But that's sort of where the future of trans local that's transportation right. is going to be heading. And local match can be a, a number of different things, right? It could be a cash contribution to the project, or it could be right-of-way dedication. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, the city may own property where we want to build a new roadway. And if we dedicate that right-of-way, it, of course, brings the cost of that project down and that value can be considered as, as a local match. Uh, the critical date here is at the bottom, July of 2015. Uh, the, the TIP has to be adopted by that date in order for DOT to, um, to uh, continue receiving federal transportation enhancement funds. The project list itself, as I mentioned, is just one component of the P3.0 process. Um, right now, we have just created that inventory of projects. Uh, in the future, we will be moving forward through the prioritization process. Uh, but it is a multimodal list. It includes projects for roadway enhancements, uh, public transportation, bicycle, pedestrian, aviation, 
etc. Uh, but for the purpose of this discussion, we just wanted to cover some of the most impactful uh, roadway projects. Uh, when I presented this to the TAC last month, we went through every single one line by line, and it took well over an hour and a half. So. Uh, for respect of your time as well as those at home, we probably just try to keep the discussion at a high level, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have as, as we go through. The inventory was created from uh, all of our existing planning documents. We pulled all together uh, the recommendations of those plans and we vetted that through the public comment process. And as I mentioned before, the TAC did approve the current the list in its current form uh, in January. Before we jump into the to the specifics, I do want to mention that it's organized based upon the STI structure. So when we begin, we'll talk about statewide projects, you know, the ones that will probably have the highest probability for funding, and then we'll move on to uh, the regional level and then wrap up at the division level. Probably one of the most critical projects on the list is improving the capacity at uh, Marine Boulevard and Western Boulevard. Right now, this is a, a significant bottleneck for, for most uh, commuter traffic on a day-to-day -day basis. And up until a few months ago, DOT had a project uh, that would superimpose a very large and very expensive grade-separated interchange. Um, right here um, in the commercial center of, of Jacksonville. Uh, not only was that project extremely expensive, uh, it was about $70 million, which in comparison to the Jacksonville uh, Parkway, that's more than twice uh, what that project cost. But it would also wipe out a number of these businesses that are shown on the, uh, on the screen there and include control access for a distance of about 2,000 feet in either direction along both Marine Boulevard and Western Boulevard. So needless to say, the impact would have been extremely significant. Moving forward, the TAC elected to go with what I call as a more reasonable approach to the problem. <coughs> the Jacksonville Parkway and West Huff Drive were constructed for a reason. And the primary intent was to alleviate some of the congestion at this particular location. So understanding that those roadways are just now operational, we want to spend some time observing how they impact congestion here and push forward a project that is more of a traditional widening approach where we work within the existing infrastructure, um, the existing right-of-way, existing stormwater, et cetera, and, and really just improve the capacity with what we already have on the ground out there. Um, as you can see on the screen, and I'll toggle back and forth here, this is the intersection in its current configuration. As you well know, we only have two northbound and southbound lanes on Western Boulevard, uh, only two southbound lanes on Marine Boulevard. Uh, this will widen that out to a three-lane cross-section, hopefully greatly improving the capacity. And again, in unison with all the other improvements around, uh, we expect that to improve congestion at that location. Other projects that are included on the list are uh, a project for US-17 at Piney Green Road. That's a similar type of situation where DOT was proposing a very large and expensive interchange. With the construction project that's currently underway, we anticipated that capacity would be adequate for at least the foreseeable future. And if at some point in the future we need to improve that, maybe the grade or the uh, grade separated interchange wasn't the way to go, we should look at something more reasonable like the approach at Western Boulevard. With Lejeune Boulevard, uh, we're focusing on access management improvements where needed, and also widening some of the intersections there, particularly Corbin and Pine Valley, as well as Western Boulevard to accommodate uh, peak hour traffic. US 258 2453, this is the intersection coming off of the bypass 
as you're heading towards Richlands where we have all of that uh, left turn congestion from Richlands heading towards Marine Boulevard. Uh, this project would improve the capacity of that intersection. And then the last one there on the screen is improving the intersection of US 17 and Old Maplehurst right there at the entrance to uh, the air station. So any questions on the statewide projects before we move into and the next you, category? And if you look at that list that you've got, you know, the, the statewide projects have a local ID of letter S in front of it and are highlighted in yellow. That's correct. So this list shows all the projects that we've submitted that are, that are com that can compete as state level projects. Moving into the next category here with uh, regional projects, one of the new ideas that we came up with was evaluating an extension of NC 111 from Highway 258 over to Gum Branch Road at Ramsey Road. Uh, this is, uh, as a point of reference, the intersection at uh, 111 is right there where the new signal was installed, where you turn to go to the airport. And of course, uh, we all know where the intersection of, of Ramsey and Gum Branch is. Uh, the benefit of this project is twofold. First of all, you get the connectivity between those two major routes, 258 and Gum Branch, uh, which currently doesn't exist today. Uh, but with that new facility, we would also be able to redesignate Gum Branch Road as NC 111 bringing that roadway from a division level facility up to a regional level facility. So understanding that being stuck in the division level pot, there's limited opportunity for investment. Uh, and understanding also the, the traffic patterns out there, we definitely know that that roadway needs improvement today and will also need that in the future. Getting it to that regional level improves the probability of being able to fund a project out there. And another advantage is where we cross the new river, there's, it's less environmentally significant. And, and while we have our western corridor extension that goes through Burton Park and visualized, cross the new river at that area is very, very, very expensive. And again, a project like that would have a hard time competing, you know, because it's that expensive. So this may be able to compete a little bit more effectively because the price is a little lower. It's also a regional level project. Unfortunately, the Northwest Corridor is stuck in the division level funding pot. So um, same issue that we had with Gum Branch Road, uh, being stuck down there, it's, it's less likely that it would be an actual funded project. Uh, another project shown on the screen here is widening of NC 111. It's not to say that we would want to make this a four-lane or a six-lane divided highway. Uh, really what we're looking at there is improving the safety by adding left and right turn lanes where needed and also uh, adding shoulders to improve safety. Another regional project is the Jacksonville Parkway. Uh, the intent here is to extend the parkway from its current terminus at Gateway North uh, past the Commons up to Ramsey Road uh, with the intent of creating an alternative parallel facility to Marine Boulevard. Uh, so this would also open up a lot of that area in there for future economic development. Given that the city owns a lot of this property, this is an opportunity for us to partner with the DOT by dedicating right of way, lowering the, pro the, the project cost, and in turn making it a lot more uh, feasible for funding, or uh, competitive for funding. Other regional projects improving the intersections of Marine and Gum Branch, as well as Western and Gum Branch. Uh, those uh, areas are, are typical bottlenecks for, for commuter traffic. And also looking at access management improvements for Western Boulevard. 
We don't really know what the full scope of that project would entail, but uh, looking at the data, we'll probably be talking some sort of center median along the old section of Western Boulevard between uh, Highway 17 and, and Highway 24. And could there, there's a study going on right now, a corridor study for that section of Western, which would come up with possible solutions That's right. that we would then, you know, include in this project. You mentioned extension of Jacksonville Parkway to yes, Ramsey sir. Road. Mm -hmm. the, that the city owns yes, sir. quite a bit of the land? Yes, sir. Where? Uh, at both ends of, of where the proposed road would be, uh, so the city currently owns property right here at the intersection of Western and existing Jacksonville Parkway. Right. And then the city also was dedicated some property here at the, I guess, the, the eastern end of where that roadway would be. Um, I that was all wetlands. Well, that's something that we would have to explore. Um, our understanding is there may be enough upland to build uh, a roadway, maybe not necessarily a whole development or something like that, but we could potentially snake a roadway uh, through that property. Well, Mr. Bittner, you are also a proposed development in that particular area, Morgan yes, track, right? And we have been in, uh, talking to Mr. McCray about his plans and uh, understanding that his commitment to dedicate the right of way would improve the probability of that roadway being funded. Uh, he seems to be very supportive of, of setting aside whatever property is necessary in order to make this happen. We've been doing a lot of homework on this project, <laughs> sir. Uh, I think this is uh, this is probably going to be one of our higher priority projects moving forward. You got your hands full negotiating with McCray. <laughs> okay. Any questions on regional projects before we move into the last category, uh, division level? Division projects are shown in green on the list here. And as you can see, they far outnumber any of the other types of projects that we have. Um, one thing that I will mention is that this is a comprehensive list that we started with several months ago. And uh, two of these projects were actually deleted from consideration. And on the list, they just reference that by saying delete underneath the spot identification number. On the screen here is a, is a, a illustration that we just looked at for the Jacksonville Parkway extension. And of course that project is, is still shown here, but it is uh, shown in the, the thin red line as opposed to the thick red lines for the uh, division level projects. But in my mind, one of the most critical needs for our community today is, a wi is the widening of Henderson Drive, uh, what people know most, com most commonly today as the Henderson Drive extension. It's the two-lane section between Gum Branch Road and Western Boulevard. So that particular project would uh, widen the road to a four-lane divided facility and at the same time improve the capacity of the intersections at Western and at Gum Branch. Extending from that would be what I tend to call the Henderson Extension Extension. It's uh, extending that roadway behind the Lone Star, behind the new uh, hotel there, uh, back over to the Jacksonville Parkway Extension. And it goes without, without saying that if you're forcing all of that traffic from Jacksonville Parkway and the Henderson <coughs> extension over to Ramsey Road, we would also want to look at improving that section between wherever the Jacksonville Parkway ends back over to uh, Marine Boulevard. I guess at that point it's uh, Newburn Highway. We uh, spoke briefly about the Northwest Corridor. It's a very expensive project, but one of the benefits is that the right-of-way, at least for the most part, has already been dedicated. So that will bring down the project cost, but at $100 million, it's going to be exceedingly difficult to fund at that division level. 
it, it's still going to be on our uh, project list and we're going to continue to pursue it but the question is how competitive will it actually be improving uh, excuse me realignment of uh, plantation drive at gum branch road we've talked about this several times in the past uh, this is a local project that most likely will require some type of participation in order to be competitive um, it's been a need ever since I've been working here in Jacksonville and I think that it's a, a really good project and essentially what it does is it realigns New Frontier Way to connect um, at Gum Branch Road to connect with Gum Branch Road at Plantation Drive uh, but then the project would also extend New Frontier Way back into the, to the business park and that part of the project is not shown here um, on the aerial photograph or on, on the, the, the design. Another one of the projects that we referenced during the budget workshop last month, uh, but I don't have a slide for, is extension of Commerce Drive, excuse me, Commerce Road. Uh, the intent there is to extend Commerce Road from behind the Volkswagen dealership on over to uh, Piney Green Road where there's a, a planned traffic signal and of course the developers on the opposite side of Piney Green intend to extend that roadway all the way over to Wolf Swamp. So providing that redundancy to Marine Boulevard for uh, safety as well as capacity purposes. Okay, so in a nutshell, those are really what I would consider are the, the, the highest impact projects for the Jacksonville area. Are there any questions about division level projects or any of the others before I go ahead and wrap Just up? Just an observation. Yes, sir. Both those projects, Plantation mm -hmm. and Commerce Road, probably very worthwhile. I'm not going to argue that point. Yes, sir. But considering our present financial conditions. Yes, sir. And particularly the... Uh, shortfall we have in money to maintain our existing roadways sort of a contradiction here in building new roadways because we're going to be taking money away from the maintenance of our existing streets and we're we're falling behind as i recall previous presentation in terms of maintaining our existing streets and roads just the different funding pots between maintenance and uh, yes, sir. The, the Some, somewhere along the line, the council, maybe as part of the budget presentation, needs a discussion about how we're going to fund some of these division projects and other roadway yes, sir. maintenance issues particularly. Those are yes, sir. That's an excellent point. But unfortunately, PAL bill funding would not be eligible for uh, capacity improvement or safety type projects through this formula. So um, if we were strictly for maintenance. I'm not saying yes, sir. I'm saying think outside the box. Well, we'll have to do that. That's what everybody's having to do these days. We'll do because that. there's and, and we had to put all these we maxed out our project list. We actually had to drop three. Uh, we yes, dropped sir. three. Because essentially we took all the projects that we felt were meaningful to the city of Jacksonville at the division level. And we really need to see how they score. Once they come back with a score, then we'll, we will be able to do some internal prioritization, of course, with the council and, and, and all those that are involved. Right. But I agree with you, Jerry. I mean, we're going to have some challenges. And we're going to have to balance uh, maintenance and new infrastructure uh, for the future. Because some of these projects are not only for safety and mobility, but they're also <coughs> projects that will enhance economic development within our community that are essential with the development that's ongoing. That's right. Uh, a good example is the continuation of the parkway. You know, I mean, we can't just leave the parkway ending where it is. It has to eventually come around and go back so that people can continue to use it as a bypass and go on to Newburgh uh, as it was intended to do. But the original plan would never, we, we could never get funded with the interchanges that were proposed that Western and 17 and Piney Green, that, those would never happen. So we had to look at alternative routes to make it happen. Um, 
Mr. Bittner, uh, you bring up an extremely good point, and that is we're faced with, with two financial challenges relative to roads. Number one is if you're going to build new roads like these two we just talked about, commerce and plantation, those are not going to score unless they're not going to score high enough to receive state funding unless we put in local money. Then the other issue is even without building any more new roads, the price of everything having to do with resurfacing is getting more and more expensive and the revenue is plateaued. So we're going to have to look at new methods. We're going to have to look at them statewide, whether that's a local gas tax, which nobody likes to talk about, but at the end of the day, you know, you're going to have to make a decision. And this is probably a bad example. Do you want to drive on a street like Hargett for the rest of your life, or do you expect Hargett and its counterparts to be reconstructed? You know, as a, as a city and as a state, we are facing some very challenging times when it comes to a lot of things, one of which is going to be roads. And so as we get into the budgets, we're going to be talking about some unpleasant things about how you can create revenue that can begin to address some of these situations. Well, and, and my particular, my biggest fear, and it has been for, for years, ever since we have actually got on council, we've talked with Johnny's presentation. You know, our maintenance is, is less than adequate on our current infrastructure. We have deteriorating roads everywhere. And we really don't have a fund or enough money. You know, our pile bills, is, uh, money has continued to be less and less and less, and it's going to continue to drop. And our infrastructure is deteriorating at a much faster pace than we're getting funds to replenish or resurface. That's going to that's going to hit a council very hard in the future uh, because we're getting further and further behind. If you look at the roadbeds and and the deterioration. Now, to to sum up where you are, these projects have gone through the Metropolitan Planning Organization, the MPO. They are now going to be sent to the state for scoring. That's not a local issue. That's not a political. They try to score them, what I'll call, uh, from an engineering standpoint. Once they are scored, they will come back, and the MPO and you will have an opportunity to look at the scoring and then to decide what are going to be your priorities. So we expect to have the scoring completed by when? Hopefully by mid-February. Uh, we'll at least have some preliminary numbers and of course uh, it will continue to go through the DOT process. Some of the numbers they have to calculate by hand so we won't have a definitive score until early summer uh, but the intent would be to come back to the council mid-summer <coughs> and talk about the prioritization list and, and really make some tough decisions on uh, which projects we want to support and, and which may have to wait for another day. Any other questions? Mr. Mayor, if you don't mind, could we take about a 10-minute break? We'll come back for our last workshop item. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir.